So uh, the point of my presentation is to discuss why algorithms matter when you are looking for oil and gas. And I will start by this question. Why would you dare going in the middle of nowhere looking for oil and gas? Is there anyone sane who wants to go, for example, in the middle of the Mediterranean looking for gas? And as you may probably know, uh, this summer, by going in the middle of the Mediterranean, any, my company and I was able to make one of the largest gas discovery in the Mediterranean. So the point of this presentation is what has driven the decision to go there 200 kilometers off the coast looking for, for gas? Because if you think, for if you are rational and you think about uh, the size of the surface of the earth and the number of places where we have found gas, the ratio is of the number of places divided by the size of the surface of the earth is close to zero. So the probability of finding oil or gas in a given point, for example, under here, is close to zero. So what, what is the reason, what are the drivers that uh, lead us looking for gas or oil in some place? So to start, there is the, the knowledge of the, the geologists that have some very general models. For example, we know that we can go looking for oil and gas close to, close to rivers delta because the flow of the water is carrying a lot of organic matter. Then there are the sediments. Sediments and organic matter mixes, and uh, the, the, the organic matter get buried in deep uh, in the earth, and under the right condition of temperature and pressure, the organic matter is transformed into oil and gas. So, for example, the discovery in the Mediterranean is close to the Nile Delta. Okay? So, by starting from the knowledge of the geologist, we know broadly where to go and look for oil and gas. But of course, I think that it's better to have a look before starting drilling a new, a new well. And this very, it's really common sense. We, this is from our everyday life. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about remote sensing, imaging, data algorithms, supercomputers and algorithms, and then don't forget all the people that are using these technologies in order to explore for new oil and gas reserves. I don't know if any one of you is familiar with, with seismic Im imaging, so in order to start setting the ground for, for my talk, I will uh, make an analogy what, with uh, what we do with medical imaging. And this is what we did in the past. In the past, uh, the image was the data. So for example, this is, an exam this is an example of radiography, medical radiography, where you have a, a source of uh, x-rays, then there is the body of the patient, and then there is the x-ray plate, and in this way you get directly the image on the x-ray plate. There was no data between uh, the, the body of the patient and then the final image. Nowadays it's different. Uh, this is an example that is very similar with what happens with computerized tomography. So you see on the left hand side, this is a section of a human body. And in this case, we acquire a lot of data from different position. And on the right hand side, you see how this data looks. And you notice immediately that the data are different from the image. Okay. And so the point is that if you want to get the image, you need an algorithm. You need an algorithm that converts the data into the image. And in this case, the name of this algorithm is the filtered back projection. Okay? Maybe someone knows that this, this is also known as the radon transform, which is uh, an old mathematical theory. Okay? This is very similar to what happens with seismic data that are the data that we use to obtain images of the subsurface before, before looking for oil and gas, before deciding to drill a new well. And so we start by doing a seismic acquisition. In a seismic acquisition, we basically use vibrations to probe the earth, uh, the subsurface. So we generate this vibration at the surface, as I'm showing here in this cartoon, and then we record the reflections, the reverberations of this vibration at the surface. And you see that, as I showed you before uh, in the medical imaging case, the data are different from the image. If you look to the data, you are not able to uh, have any clue about what is the shape of the subsurface that generated those data. And so again, we need an algorithm 
that we call seismic imaging, which actually is not just a single algorithm, but it's a set of algorithms. And we need this algorithm to transform the data in something that is really similar to the subsurface structure, as I've tried to show, the, to show in, this, uh, in this image. You see there are these lines that uh, the geologist calls the, the, the faults, then the, there are these layers that correspond to different rock formations. So indeed, I hope that this is enough to convince you that we can get images that resemble the art structure. For me, the, what, what, what is an algorithm for me? The algorithm starts from some mathematical theory, and you see that this history started a long time ago. Some of the equations that we are using nowadays to, to image the Earth's subsurface from seismic data, some of those equations was developed uh, some four, 400 years ago. For example, with the acoustic wave equation, then there have been some progress until the 70s. At the beginning of the 70s, uh, the industry started using this mathematical equation to actually get the images. I want to, to make a footnote here because I think uh, that this can be something that is relevant to this conference. And it is something that was introduced by this professor at Stanford University, John Claire Bout, who was one of the first that raised an issue about computational research. I mean, research where the result of the research are given by an algorithm. And this is important because of the issue of reproducibility, because you know that reproducibility of research is one of the cornerstones of the scientific method. And John Claire Bout was the first to notice that when the result of your algorithm, of your research is the result of an algorithm, then it is fundamental in order to guarantee reproducibility that both the data and the algorithm are available to other researchers to verify that what you are saying, that the results that you are showing are repeatable. And I think that this is relevant not only for the research that is made by the geophysical community, but for example, nowadays that we talk about big data, results from big data, that I think that this can be an issue. Anyway, what I do every day is to go from equations to algorithm. So to me, what, what you are seeing in the first row of this, uh, of this slide is something that is similar to plateau horses, or if you want, to the triangles and the rectangles of the Euclidean geometry. Then on the second row, there is the algorithm that is the, the real world horse, that are the, the real world triangle and rectangle that are not as perfect uh, as those that were in Plato's mind or in Euclid, uh, Euclid mind. But these are what you need in order to actually solve your problem and, for example, being able to model how a seismic wave propagates uh, in the subsurface. In order to do so, you need the algorithm, not the mathematics. But without the mathematics, you cannot write any algorithm, at least to me that I'm working with the data from the physical world. But then, by using these, starting from these equations, using these algorithms, we are able to produce images and then to use these images to, to take decisions, to decide where to drill new wells, until which depth we have to, to drill the, this, uh, this well. And of course, this is very important to, to our industry because uh, of uh, the economic issues because of safety issues and so it is very important that we are able to get as much information as we can before starting drilling new wells and looking for, for oil and gas. Then what is, what is the challenge for, for this, uh, this activity for uh, being able to use this algorithm? The challenge is the computational complexity and the amount of data that we want to process. So you see in this slide, I don't want to enter it into the details, but I've taken some numbers from uh, uh, what is a, a standard ac seismic acquisition nowadays that covers an area that is in the order of some 5,000 square kilometers. And with this, when you acquire seismic data over such a large uh, area, you end up with an amount of data that is in, in the order of tens of terabytes. And then if you want to use the, the most complex algorithms, then the most accurate algorithms that we can use to transform this data into an image, 
you, make, you can make this computation and you end up with a figure that is in the order of 10 to the 21, 21st operations that are needed in order to do this transformation. And if you assume that the total computational capacity is in the order of one petaflop, which is 10 to the 15 operations per second, then you end up with a total computing time that is 70 days. 70 days nowadays is not affordable for our business because, of course, you have to take into account that everything that we do is bound by time constraints. So we have to do whatever we can in order to reduce, to shorten this time. And, of course, the first ingredient is to have enough computational capacity. Take into account that one petaflop, 10 to the 15, is, something, is a computing capacity that is in the order of uh, 1,000, more than 1,000, laptop like the ones, the, the one that I'm using for this presentation. Probably we are closer to two to three thousand laptops. We can also decide to use less. We can use less accurate algorithms, but you see that in that case we are going to compromise the quality and the accuracy of the, resu the result. In this example I am comparing the result that I can get from the same data by, by using two different algorithms, the one on the left-hand side, which is the fastest, and the one on the right-hand side that is the most computationally expensive, but I don't think that you need to be an expert to, to realize that the image on the right-hand side is definitely better than the one on the left-hand side. Where there is fog on one side, there is something that is interpretable on the other, on the other side. Luckily enough, te computer technology is offering us uh, a significant opportunity. In this slide, I'm showing uh, the data that are taken from this top 500 list, that is a list that you can find on the web, that ranks the most uh, uh, powerful supercomputer in the world. And the horizontal axis is year is the year, and on the vertical axis in the, is the computational performance, the teraflops, the petaflops of the most powerful supercomputer. And you see that the vertical scale is logarithmic. So over 10 years, the computing capacity of the fastest supercomputer in the world has increased by a factor of 1,000, which is very, very much. If you go into the details of this, this chart, you will uh, realize that this uh, rate of growth is even faster than the famous Moore laws. We, this is faster than Moore law because we are not looking to a single computer, but to an aggregation of many computers, because nowadays a supercomputer is actually an aggregation of, of computers. But in any case, this is for sure providing an ingredient. This is giving us the computing capacity that we need to do uh, whatever we want to do in less than 70 days. And I like to, 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 to show you this quotation from John von Neumann that maybe many of you know that is the father of all the computers that we are using today uh, due to the famous uh, von Neumann architecture. And uh, in 1949, he was working on what uh, we can define as the first supercomputer in Princeton at the Institute of, of uh, Advanced Studies. And that supercomputer had some in the order, was in the order of five kilobytes of memory, 1,200 flops. And he thought that uh, they could have reached the, the limits of what was possible to achieve with computer techno technology. But since von Neumann was really a smart guy, he said also that one should be careful with such statement. And indeed, today we are many, many order of magnitude better than, than that. But this is uh, the, the starting point, really the starting point for, for computer technology. High performance computing is offering us an opportunity, and uh, my company and I decided to, to exploit this, uh, this opportunity. And so in 2014, we have deployed one of the largest uh, supercomputer in, uh, in the oil and gas industry, especially in Europe. Here on the right hand side, I'm showing you the list of the most powerful supercomputers at uh, November 2014. Uh, the first one is in China, then a lot of them are in the U.S., as ex expectable. And then there is, there is ENI. What is relevant is that uh, our system is f the first one for the industry. So all the systems be before are for, uh, for basically for scientific research. But the point of this slide is not uh, to, to, to tell that uh, ENI has big muscles, uh, we can deploy a supercomputer, but it, on, the, on the figures that you see here on the right hand side, where there are two columns, the first one shows the number of petaflops, 
And the second one is showing the electrical consumption of these systems. And we are talking about megawatts. Indeed, since the computing capacity is comparable to those of thousands of uh, desktop computers, you, you may assume that for one desktop computer, the electrical consumption is the, in the order of one kilowatt. Multiply that by 1,000, and you get uh, one megawatt. And so the problem is the efficiency of these systems, because uh, they have to be sustainable, both for the balance sheet of our company, but also for the environment. And so I've taken the numbers that are shown the, in, the, in the list, and I have rearranged them by computing the computational efficiency, which is the ratio between the computational capacity and the electrical consumption. And if you rearrange the data, on the, on the horizontal axis, there is the ranking in the previous list, and in the, on the vertical axis, there is the index of the computational efficiency. And you see that our system is among the, the best. The, notice that these data are referred to November 2014. Maybe that today it is different because the, this technology is improving very fast. Nonetheless, the point is here is that uh, we are doing everything that we can do in order to be more efficient. And this, is, this has an impact on our algorithms. So for us, it is very important to have a continuously ongoing R&D activities, trying to identify what, what is the hardware that best suits our software. And the software is constantly modified in order to match the characteristics of the hardware in order to be not just fast, not to get only the performance, but also to be efficient and be sustainable. And this is another aspect that to me is very important when you are talking about algorithms, because taking into account that, for example, every time you make a search with Google, you are consuming some energy. Someone has made a rough computation of how much, how many watts of energy are consumed by each search with Google. And the, and the point of being efficient is very important for organizations like Google, Facebook, Amazon, that have very large server farms significantly larger than those uh, you have seen in the list before. So this is a problem that is common to, to all the industry. Of course, uh, we've not done yet. Uh, the, the technologies that we are using for, for seismic imaging uh, is still uh, under development. And if I, have to, if I want to give you a feeling of what is going to happen in the future, my expectation that is that the next change will be similar to those that uh, to the change that happened when we went from black and white television to color television because the reason is that at the moment we are assuming that we are making scalar measurements whilst the phenomenon that we, we are exploiting in order to get the images is actually something that is measured by vectors the problem is that uh, if you are dealing with vectors that means uh, much more data, at least three times the, num the, the, the amount of data that we are processing today, and much more expensive algorithms. So again, this possibility of having this development is strictly linked to computer technologies and our ability to write better algorithms. And then finally, to conclude, my point is that technology is very important, algorithms are very important, but don't forget that each time a company like ENI or any oil company is able to discover a new, to, to make a new discovery of oil and gas. This is not just due to the technology, but it is mainly due to the work of a lot of people that are collaborating to, uh, together, that are integrated their knowledge and their competencies. So technology is important, but then you need the, the driver. Okay, thank you very much.